Let's pray together. Lord, um, <laughs> the words of man, Lord God, may be feeble. It may just fall to the ground. But Lord God, your word never does. Lord God, you have said your word is like, like raindrops, like snow. Lord God, your word will not come back to you void, but it will fulfill all purposes. So Lord Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will truly, Lord God, speak to your people. I pray, Lord, that at this time that you will give your people, Lord God, the spirit of wisdom and revelation that they may know you better. That it will not be an informational time, but it will take us deeper into our appreciation, Lord, for what you have done in sending your son, Jesus Christ. But more than anything else, God, I pray that we will be a people who yearn, who live for your second coming. And I pray that you will truly speak that unto your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, just as our brother Frank shared, uh, he was talking about this idea of, you know, enriching their minds so that they would be people who uh, are prepared for his coming. And that's kind of the theme that I want to take it. I, I recognize there are some of you here today that weren't here last week, so you might just get lost. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit and just kind of, uh, today is kind of technically part two, but I'll, I'll tell you enough in the beginning so you're not lost and then you can just follow just from being here today. And basically what, was, uh, what we have been doing uh, over the past weeks is uh, from our Bible time reading, right? So then whatever passages that we cover in the Old Testament or New Testament, we will preach on a particular passage that really spoke to us. Uh, and this, the past week's reading, well not this past week's reading, but the week before that, there were a lot of uh, stuff in Deuteronomy about uh, the different feasts, which were actually introduced in the book of Leviticus. And sometimes, you know, we say like the book of Leviticus, Leviticus and these things are like oh my gosh I have to read this and so forth and I, I I know this may sound a little bit crazy I used to think that way too but I remember as I studied the scriptures and I started to understand what the heck this Levitical laws were about I remember as I was reading the book of Leviticus I again I'm not I'm not uh, exaggerating anything I'm not trying to act like I'm holy or anything like that but as I was reading the book of Leviticus some years back I remember thinking like I was getting like personal revival like every time there was a passage where like the aroma went up to the Lord and it was pleasing to God of the sacrifice aroma like I don't know why but like I just felt so happy like I felt so pleased and like this was some many years ago about a dozen years ago and so I really wanted to teach on the seven different feasts of Israel and I kind of brought, uh, went, went over that last week uh, very in a quick time span because last week like people just kept on sharing testimony after testimony that I barely had enough time so today it's kind of part two of that where I'm going to really uh, go a little bit more in depth in helping us understand what is the importance of these seven different feasts because they were extremely important and they are still very important to the Jewish community today where they go over these things and, and these are the three times during the year when all the Jewish people are supposed to gather in an entire assembly to celebrate something so what is it that they celebrate and so we're gonna look at the things that they celebrate that are the foreshadowing of Christ and then the three fall feasts that are to foreshadow Jesus's second coming See, the book of Deuteronomy, the, uh, the, the word Deutero, right, it means two, right? And then Nami, is, N-O-M, that part is talking about words or law. So Deuteronomy is actually the giving of the law for the second time. So when Moses went up to Mount Sinai and in the book of Exodus, God gave him all these laws and Leviticus has the priestly laws. But remember, because these people... The Israelites, they would not obey the Lord. And when they spy the, uh, um, the promised land, they're like, oh no, we can't go there. I mean like, oh, man, God must really hate us that he brought us out here so we could die here. That's literally what they said, right? And they were going to stone Moses and kill them all and appoint a leader to take them back to Egypt. 
And so it's actually a very sad story, a pretty pathetic story, because if you look at the timeline of these Israelites in the desert, that desert is not very big. Okay, you could easily cross over that desert within two weeks. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 2, it says that for them to have gone from uh, the land of uh, Egypt in this region called Goshen uh, to Kadesh Barnea, which was pretty much at the border of the promised land, it says in uh, Deuteronomy 1 2 that it would have taken 11 days. It would have taken 11 days, but it took them 40 years. Why did it take them 40 years? It's not it took them 40 years to get there. They got to Kadesh Barnea in the very early part of their journey. But that 40 years happened because basically it was this pathetic, it was this uh, uh, just sad waiting period for that first generation of Israelites to all die off because God told them well you're not going to get into the promised land so anybody who was 20 years and older at the time of the exodus you were not going to enter the promised land so they basically they kind of wandered around in that region in Kadesh Barnea for about 38 years so all that you read okay uh, up until I mean in Exodus and all these stories almost all of that happens within the first year or two of their journey and they're just kind of waiting off for that first generation to die so that these people will actually enter into the promised land and so one of the key themes in the in the first five books of the Old Testament the Torah is about instant obedience because if you remember when they do the Passover and they're supposed to take unleavened bread right because what God told them was you don't have time to wait for the bread to rise with that yeast you take that and go this is how you're to even eat the Passover lamb is that you're gonna do it with your um, uh, sandals there and you're gonna hold your staff in one hand and you're gonna uh, just have your uh you know back back in those days right even men wore like kind of like dress like things right and so you're supposed to uh, strap them on so that you're ready to walk so basically you're supposed to eat the Passover lamb but you're ready to take off at my command and one of the key things in all of scripture is instant obedience and that's why God tells them through Moses in Deuteronomy 1 2 you know it would have only taken you 11 days to get here but here we are in our 40th year and Moses pretty much the entire book of Deuteronomy is Moses's last three sermons his dying words to the Israelites and say look when you enter the promised land things are going to be good this land is really going to be great but you got to remember you need to obey the words of the Lord and basically he's pleading with these people these are what God requires of us please make sure that you honor the Lord that's why in today's reading selection it talks about how Moses tells them to esteem God highly and I shared this couple of Fridays ago as well where really it, it, I know it sounds so elementary, but that's one of the things I actually uh, pray for my heart as well. Like, God, may I truly esteem you greatly in my life. May I not take you for granted. May I not just walk in and out of church, but like, when I think of you, God, like, I want to just regard you in the highest place of my life. I want to walk in the fear of the Lord. And that really needs to be the heart and attitude of the people of God because we are living in the end times and in the book of Revelation, man, it's no joke. Hard things are coming and in fact, it says in the book of Revelation that many will fall away during that time. And so what's going to happen is, is that there's going to be this kind of shaking, it says, right? And, and, and the people who are never really the bride in the first place, the ones who wanted God as their sugar daddies, you know, the ones who wanted God to give them everything that they wanted in this life, they are going to fall away. But the bride of Christ who are in love with Christ right just as when we marry somebody and when we are deeply in love with them and we take our marriage vows seriously and say you know for better for worse for sicker for uh you know in health or poor for richer it doesn't matter when you deeply love and when you are in a covenant relationship with that person and all of the new testament is telling us that we're in a blood covenant relationship with jesus then we will not fall away because he is our reward 
And we will see actually what that means in the last festival, last feast of Israel. So again, when, you, when we go over these seven feasts in the Bible, again, there are people in the church who look at that and go, oh, you know, like, oh my gosh, like I have to learn this stuff and, and whatnot. But what I hope to convey to us is just what Jesus has done is so amazing. Not only that, but that we need to learn to be a people who live for His second coming. Because beloved brothers and sisters, if we are not living for His second coming, then I dare say that your life is out of whack. Like you're missing the mark here. I don't know what you're living for. I don't know if you're living for that day when you will retire and live off your 401k, but I'm telling you, that's not what the Lord is telling us. And He's saying, I'm coming soon. And He is coming for His lovesick bride who are longing and awaiting His coming. He's not coming for people who are warming up the seats of the church who are kind of like, you know, it's like, Jesus, please don't come back. You know, like, don't come back anytime soon. Let me live my life, you know. That's not the people Jesus is coming for. I'm not trying to, I mean, I don't even make a joke out of that, okay. So we're going to take a look at the seven different feasts in the Bible how God fulfills them and how three of them are yet to be fulfilled in this completion. So let's go to the next slide. I showed this uh, slide to you guys uh, last week and basically it was a, just an understanding of the, so the first month is Nisan, okay, the first month of the calendar and so there's three springtime feasts, okay, so the Passover as we know well, the Passover lamb and the unleavened bread and the first fruits, they're happening back to back to back. So then the Passover is on the 14th day of that first month and then the unleavened bread happens a day after for a seven day period and then the first fruits happens because the Feast of Unleavened Bread is for seven days. At some point it's going to hit a Sunday, right? The day after the Sabbath Saturday. So then the first fruits is celebrated on the Sunday, okay? So then there's three different spring feasts that happen just uh, on succession. Sometimes the Bible will refer to it as a, a, a first fruits uh, um, feast, referring to all three of them combined. And then 50 days after the feast of first fruits is the Pentecost or feast of weeks, okay? Uh, and, and, that, uh, and that is, of course, the day when the uh, Holy Spirit came on Acts 2, but it has parallel to actually the Old Testament because this is a day when God met Israel on Mount Sinai and gave them the Ten Commandments. So the birth of the nation of Israel happened on Pentecost or Shavuot like, as the Israelites call it, and the birth of the church happened on Pentecost. So basically the springtime feasts, and then there's one summer feast, Pentecost, cost and three months later there's these three fall feasts that are back to back to back and so the first one is called Rosh Hashanah or the feast of trumpets where they would bring a uh, call on the trumpets right and the Israelites were supposed to drop what they were doing if they were working they drop what they were doing and they gathered together to worship the Lord and then that was on the 10th day of this part, uh, seventh month and then the day of atonement, I'm sorry, first day of the seventh month, and then on the 10th day was the day of atonement, the holiest day of Israel, when all the sins of Israel were to be forgiven or not, uh, depending on God's judgment, and that was a day when the whole Israelite community fasted. And then on the 15th day, there was a seven-day celebration called the Feast of Tabernacles or uh, Feast of Booths, okay, where they made temporary shelters uh, for seven days of celebration. And, and the whole idea was this. So uh, the Passover, of course, was when God, right, sent the last plague on Egypt, and the Passover lamb, the blood was put on their doorposts and the angel of death would pass over those houses and not kill their firstborn, the Israelites. And that's where the Passover comes from. And what we need to understand is that the Exodus event for all of Israelite history, that is the uh, mark, uh, the climax of their history. The Exodus event is their salvation history from slavery in Egypt. So the Passover feast and the feast of unleavened bread remember it was so that they had to move and get up and go and remember leaven or the yeast represents sin 
And so this, of course, Jesus, he was a Passover lamb, right? When John the Baptist lay hold, laid his eyes on him, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the unleavened bread, what that represents is without sin because there's no yeast in it and Jesus was that perfect sacrifice and then now the feast of first fruits what that represented to the uh, the Israelites was because they lived in an agrarian society and that was when they did their barley harvest and so the very first fruits of their barley harvest the best of it they would wave before God and that marked their feast of first fruits and we'll see in the scriptures, and I'll, I'll show that to you in a moment, where Jesus is called the first fruits of all believers because he is the one who first resurrected from the dead and the rest of us will join him in that. So those springtime feasts were all fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Now of course we know that the Pentecost was fulfilled because that was with the sending of the Holy Spirit. So now... Um, Remember, after Jesus was raised from the dead on the Feast of First Fruits, and it happened exactly to the day. So the Passover, he died on the Passover. Normally they say when someone was crucified, it would take them about three days to die. And they say that pain is like beyond torture because of asphyxiation they would die because they can't breathe but every breath they would take would be so painful like again beyond human comprehension but Jesus died within six hours okay he 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. he was dead and he died on this Passover now the Jews when they count off days they count they're always inclusive so Jesus rose, you know, resurrected after three days. Well, it's because it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And the, he happened to, the Passover happened to be on a Friday that, that year. And then, so what we see is that when he resurrects, he resurrects the day after the Sabbath. And you remember, Jewish Sabbath is on a Saturday. And so he resurrected on the Feast of first fruits, which always happens on the day after Sabbath. So it's to the T, to the day, when his death, in crucifixion, death, and resurrection happened according to this Jewish calendar. Remember the last supper he has with the, his disciples. It wasn't technically the Passover feast, but that was what it represented. And so the Pentecost happened, remember, 50 days after the first fruits. And that symbolism is very important because 7 times 7 is 49. So the 50th day, 50th year, remember, in the Jewish calendar was a year of jubilee. It was something that the Israelites would only experience once in their lifetime, twice if you're lucky enough. And it was the greatest year for them because it represented all their all the slaves were freed all their lands were returned it was a celebration of remembering who they were in God and so now this has a significance to that because again it was a 50th year and the Pentecost happens on the 50th day now from first fruits to Pentecost is 50 days remember Jesus resurrected on the day of first fruits and he was with the disciples uh, for 40 days on earth after he resurrected until he ascended to heaven in Acts 1. So what do they do? Right? Jesus tells them, you don't go anywhere. Stay in Jerusalem and you pray until the Holy Spirit comes until you receive power from on high. And so they were actually in that upper room praying for 10 days and then the Holy Spirit came. So the Pentecost represented the birth of the nation of Israel in Exodus 19 and 20 when the law was given by Moses and it represents the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost as we see and the 3,000 men come to Christ now the feast of Israel the the trumpets as I explained to you was a day when they would blow the trumpet and they were to drop everything and assemble to worship God and the day of atonement that happened nine days after that was a day that one day in the calendar when the high priest was allowed to go into the most holy place in the temple and atone for the sins of all Israel throughout the whole year. So 
that was a most holy day when everyone fasted and then the Feast of Tabernacles, what that celebration was about, why did they live in these like little patched up tents and so forth? It was to remember that while they were in Egypt or while they were in the desert, they had nothing. That God gave them manna, God gave them quail to eat, God gave them water from rocks. And so it was this understanding even after they entered the promised land, there was a time when our people, when our forefathers, they were in the desert and they, all they had was God. They had nothing else. They had God, but that was enough. And that was their, the idea of celebrating for those seven days. And so that Feast of Tabernacles was the feast of rejoicing in the uh, scriptures. And so, which is important, and I'll, get, I'll expound on that in a moment. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, this is just kind of uh, understanding, okay? I mean, just decent correlation Right, so Passover, crucifixion, unleavened bread, bur burial of Jesus. So it represents our justification by his crucifixion, sanctification, and glorification through resurrection. And then the harvest or the Passover, right, where it's the Holy Spirit. And so we're living in this church age for 30, right, so for three months uh, after the Pentecost, uh, there is no feast until the day of trumpets and so that's the age the spiritual age that we're living in and then the trumpets represents rapture they put you know question marks there because it's kind of people debate a little bit of the nuances of that uh and then the jewish uh the the rem day of atonement and, and of course the the thousand year reign and the earthly kingdom with the feast of tabernacles so um yeah, some people ask me for the slides. If you want it, I'll, I'll send it to you if you don't get it all down and so forth. But again, I'm going to try to uh, work that together from the Old and New Testament with each of them and just expound on those. Let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, let's look at Leviticus. Let's look at Leviticus 23. And we'll just kind of go through this chapter in the KJV. <laughs> just so we have just a general understanding of this. So, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to the holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It's a Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month, at even is, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day, the very next day of the same month, is a feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. And seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein. So on those days you don't do work. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. So the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So those are the three springtime feasts that we see in the scriptures. Uh, verse 12, and you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and the lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths deals of fine flour mingled with oil, and the offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. And you shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears until the self same day that you have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, so the day of the Feast of first fruits, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So 49 days. 
Verse 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So now it's getting into the Pentecost. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two ten deals. Now, remember the Feast of First Relief really was just one wave and there's a significance to these two waves and that symbolism that many people believe to this day is that the two loaves now represents the Jews and Gentiles and so now it was a completion of God's salvation plan so now let's keep going they shall be a fine flour they shall be baked with leaven and they are the first fruits unto the Lord and you shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year and one young bullock and two rams and they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and their drink offerings even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord. With the two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the self same day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. You shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statue forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So that's the explanation of Pentecost with God's provision for even the poor saying, look, don't pick up after, don't glean after you, leave those for the poor. So that's the Pentecost, the summer uh, feast. And then verse 23, and we'll hit up the three fall feasts now. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel saying in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So the feast of trumpets, the Rosh Hashanah. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, and also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement, our sixth feast. It shall be a holy convocation to you. And you shall afflict your souls, meaning you shall fast and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, whoever doesn't fast, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatever, who, uh, whoever soul that does any work on that same day, that person, uh, that same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls. In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, and now here is our last feast, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, the fifteenth day of the seven months shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation, a, uh, an assembly of people, right? You shall do no, no work therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which shall, you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering and a meat offering, a sacrifice, drink offerings, everything upon his day. Besides the Sabbath of the Lord, and besides your gifts, besides all your vows, besides all your freewill offerings which you give unto the Lord, also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, the branches of palm trees. Okay, well, we'll just stop here and I'll comment on it real quick. Uh, the first fruits, the feast of first fruits in the spring was a barley harvest. In the Pentecost, that harvest was of wheat. There were agrarian culture. And in the fall, usually they... Uh, harvested figs or grapes or these different fruits. Now, notice here the branches of palm trees that are being waved as a celebration in the Feast of ta uh, Tabernacles. Now, you may remember when Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time, uh, the people wave palm branches as he comes in and saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they shout Hosanna. And it was a way to receive him as king. 
And so that tradition came actually from the Feast of Tabernacles where they're uh, waving these palm branches and the significance of palm branches was when they when kings would return from war victoriously that's what people would do so it was a reception of a king and it was a celebration of that nation because their nation had won and so here is where that uh, Jesus the waving of the palm branches as Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time comes from and so let's go to the next slide and verse 40, and you shall take you on the first day, the, uh, or 41, and you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statue forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. And you shall dwell in these booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. We're going to come back to our PowerPoint, and then we'll kind of go, go briefly, bit by bit by bit, and then we'll just wrap it up together. Now, uh, let's go to slide number four. I think, is there a slide before that? Okay, right, the one right after that? Perfect. Oh, there, there we go. So... Here's the disciples, and before Jesus was to be crucified, they asked him on the first day of unleavened bread when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed. His disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Little do they know that they're actually preparing Jesus. I mean, Jesus is that Passover lamb. So then he responds, okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and, and you know that after two days, a Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Again, I mean, any good Jew, when they read this, they understand, oh, okay, Jesus is his Passover. He is everything that we had celebrated for the past 1,400 years. And so while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Once again, remember, they were to eat that lamb completely, and now Jesus is breaking his body the bread and saying this is my body and you are to eat of it you know what's also interesting is that in the face of unleavened bread you guys have had that right even in communion those matzo crackers right and they are striped and those because they make uh, bake it in fire and so that stripe represents the body of Jesus which is striped for us right and he was whipped and lashed and you know what's really interesting is that the Jews they don't understand why they do this but they still do it to this day where they break that matzo cracker the unleavened bread and they actually have a tradition of even burying that thing and bringing it back. And that, of course, represents Jesus' burial and resurrection. So now let's go to the uh, next slide. And so now one of the, of course, most touching stories in the scriptures is Abraham's obedience, right, where he is called to sacrifice Isaac. But we know that it's so much more than just a great story of obedience. This is a typology. It's a symbolism of what is to come where Abraham would not spare his only son but he was willing to sacrifice him and God is showing that this is who I am and that I'm going to do this by sending my only son Jesus Christ and so that whole story becomes so much richer when we understand God's heart because you know I could even think you know I could probably die for some people like, I, I don't hold on to my life so dearly, but like, if someone were to ask me to sacrifice one of my kids, I'd be like, you know, I, no thanks, you know, I'm sorry, you'll have to die instead. Uh, and and we, we see just God's heart, and when Isaac asks Abraham about, wait, I thought we were to make sacrifice to the Lord, but we don't even have a lamb to sacrifice. And of course, Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And of course, we know that this is to symbolize what he is going to do with Jesus. Now, in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, it says this, Knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of inherit, uh, that you inherited ways from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, 
the blood of Christ. So all, every time they were to offer an offering, right, it had to be an unblemished lamb, right, because that was what needed to be sacrificed unto God. And it, in that same way, Peter is saying, look, we have been bought by the blood of this lamb, this unblemished lamb of God. So let's go to the next slide. And Jesus now, in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, it talks about the leavening and unleavened and shows how Jesus is the unleavened bread. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. Remember, leaven, that yeast represents sin. So now you say, you are now without sin because of what Christ has done. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth okay now let's go to the next slide I want to kind of zip through this and then of course the last of the feasts the spring feast the first uh, feast of first fruits and here first Corinthians 15 20 it says but now Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep guaranteeing that we will also be raised up from the dead as well now again these spring feasts have been consummated they have been fulfilled but you know that normally it's the fall right when you reap the harvest and that's where the second coming of Jesus comes in and we'll just look at the Pentecost briefly and we'll go into the meaning of that so let's go to the uh, next slide again a lot of people they don't know this but when we read 1 Peter 2, 9, that famous passage where it talks about, you know, we're a, a holy nation, right? Uh, a royal priesthood and in, in, in God's special treasure possession. This was actually spoken to the Israelites. It, it, it's not a new verse that Peter is coming up with. It, it was actually what God spoke to them in Exodus 19. So I only put verse 6 in there, but in verse 5, God tells them, Out of all the nations of the earth, you will be my treasured possession, and you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and these are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So already the Israelite identity is that we are to be this royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests priest well what is that well you're first of all you're a king right because you are the son of the God most high so we are royal so that's why in the book of Revelation God continues to remind us that all, we're not going to just sing kumbaya and praise songs all day long in heaven God tells us for those who are faithful those who overcome I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne and that you will reign together with me so our destiny is not to sing songs for all, all night long for eternity our destiny how God has created us is so that we were destined that we were created to reign with God forever now what does that look like I don't know exactly but that's his promise so they already understood we are a kingdom and God is our king that's why when Saul and then David became king right God was initially Greek because I'm your king and they were like well we want to be like all the other nations we want a king too because the king was a the representative uh, figure he was a commander-in-chief right not just ruling but he was a great warrior and so God is like well no so their understanding needed well we are a kingdom and then we are priests because a priest is someone who represents people before God so they were called to be a people so distinct and then later on in Deuteronomy Moses tells them hey Israelites who I mean which nation is like us where God is so alive and he is so close to us that people will see our ways and they will say wow their God is indeed true and not only that one of the things that we don't understand very well in the New Testament church is this we think oh we live in the age of grace they're in the age of law so then we just think oh yeah those commands like oh yeah those were like curses because like they couldn't meet it and then Jesus met it now there's a little bit of truth to that but actually one of the greatest blessings that Israelites consider that they have for themselves is the law of God because that's what makes the Israelites Israelites that gives them their identity the people of God and the law of God so they 
consider it their great blessing. Why? Because it instructs them how they should live. It shows them the way of life. So God's law, His words are not a curse. It's actually a great blessing upon that nation and that's how they always took it and that's how the people of God need to take it as well. We of course understand that the letter of the law kills but the spirit gives life we know that we cannot fulfill the law of our own power but we also know that Jesus fulfills those laws and that we live in an age of grace but we still choose to live according to God's ways so people ask well which of the Old Testament laws are still binding and which are not it seems like Christians are always arbitrary about which one they follow and which one they don't and it's really not the case the laws that are no longer binding are ones that have already been fulfilled by Jesus. So there's no need, as the book of Hebrews tells us, to make animal sacrifices again. Even to this day, when the Roman Empire, they crushed uh, the Israelites in AD 70, so some 30-some years after Jesus' death, after that they never resurrected the temple again. The Israelites don't offer animal sacrifices. And if you were to ask a good Jewish rabbi, even to this day, well, why don't you offer animal sacrifices? They won't give you a good answer. Why? Because they should be doing it. But then they kind of, after that temple's destruction, they kind of just uh, focus more on the teaching aspect. And, but we know why that temple was destroyed and was never resurrected again because Jesus fulfilled that and there is no need for those animal sacrifices. And so again, the, there was this clear understanding that we were a kingdom, we were a royal priesthood. And that was what the Israelites were called to and often failed at. But Peter is reminding the church now in 1 Peter 2, 9, this is who we are. So God meets the Israelites. This happens at Pentecost. So in verse 16, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning. Now this is the third day of the third month. If you do the math, first day of the, um, uh, the 14th day of the first month and you do it, it, it comes out to 50 days if you include both days. And so now with a thick cloud over the mountain and very loud trumpet blast, everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And it talks about this glorious, like God is coming down with fire and cloud and the people are just so like trembling before this God of glory who thunders. And notice that there he came with this very loud trumpet blast and this is how he's gonna come in the second coming in his first coming he came as a suffering servant but in the second coming he is coming as the king of kings and the lord of lords to institute a new kingdom so God meets the Israelites at Pentecost. Now let's go to the next slide. And it's foretold in the book of Joel 2 that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh and this will be the birth of the church. So God gave the law on these stone tablets and met and, and birthed the nation of Israel on the day of Pentecost. But God poured out His Spirit and wrote His law into our hearts and poured it on all flesh and birthed the church on the day of Pentecost some 1400 years later. Now, and this is a familiar passage to us, right? Where just, you know, God will pour out spirit on all flesh and, uh, you know, your, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams and young men shall uh, see, see visions and the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the awesome day of the Lord comes. And so that's talking about the second coming. Now let's go to the next slide. So the fall feasts represent the coming kingdom. So this understanding of after Jesus' first coming is a kingdom of God has come with Jesus, but not in its fullness, right? Because it's a second coming that is coming in its fullness. So this is a day of the church between Pentecost and the fall feast where we are called to gather, right? What, I mean, what is the whole point of fall? It's to gather the harvest, and that's what we are doing, being fishers of men, being farmers who are gathering the harvest. Now... The Feast of Trumpets, again, if you think about the rapture and how it's described in the scriptures, it talks about how like 
two men will be on the fields and then one will be raised up and one will remain. And this kind of was represented even back in those days where there will be a blowing of the trumpets and a Jew may be working on the fields with an Arab and he would leave because he was to drop everything and he would go because they were called to assemble and worship the Lord. And so one would leave and one would stay in that field. So now in 1 Thessalonians 4, it makes it very clear. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive, the people who are still alive when Jesus returns uh, and on our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Again, the feasts of trumpets, when that trumpet sound shall come. Let's go to the next slide. And similarly, in a flash, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. So let's go um, to the next one. We'll kind of breeze through this. So the first day of the seventh month, the day, uh, feast of trumpets, and on the tenth day, the holiest day of the calendar, the day of atonement, and in the scriptures, it talks about this as the day of the Lord. It's the day of reckoning where a man or a woman will have to settle their accounts with God. And that's what this day represents, not only in the Old Testament, but when Jesus shall return. And so here it is. But in Hebrews 9, in Hebrews is basically a book that describes why Jesus is a fulfillment, why Jesus is better than Moses, why Jesus is better than the, the uh, priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. His priesthood was from that of Melchizedek. And so the whole book of Hebrews is trying to teach these Jewish Christians, right? Because for 1,500 years, they had practiced their religion in, in a certain way. And he's saying, no, 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 we don't have to do animal sacrifices. But to them, that would have been really jarring because it's like, well, that's all they know. And then so they explain what Jesus has done. And this is one of the explanations. This is a day of atonement, but only the high priest entered the inner room, the Holy of Holies. And that only once a year, and never without blood, he had to first sprinkle himself with blood because he was with sin, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had he had, that had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. As long as that first tabernacle, as long as that temple was there, the Holy of Holies, the most holy place was separated from the people. And of course we know when Jesus died and rose again, right? Jesus died, the temple, that the, the curtain that um, was torn into the curtain that separated the holy of holies from everybody else because they would die in that presence and so in verse 9 indicating that the gifts and sacrifice being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper they are only a matter of external regulations applying until the time of the new order so let me give you an example <laughs> we live in a day of credit card debt Americans love that plastic and they buy things they don't need. Okay, they buy what they want, but you know, the, what they can't afford and they just keep, you know, just putting that plastic, right? See, you can do that all you want, but at the end of the day, the credit card does not purchase anything for you, right? So, in a sense, what Jesus Christ has done, all these Old Testament regulations are just like swiping a credit card, but then the final payment once and for us made, the actual sins are taken away in the blood of Jesus. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats cannot atone for our sins. I mean, they are lesser beings than us. How can the blood of a bull take away the sins of people it can't in fact when the jews would gather to worship at the temple and they had to kill these living things i mean if you've seen animals die before your eyes it's not fun to watch obviously it's 
pretty gruesome. And so they would be reminded because it doesn't wash away their conscience of the worshiper, right? Because they would be reminded of just how sinful they were every time an animal had to die because of their sin. So what Jesus Christ has done, as Hebrews 9 continues to expound on, is that Jesus died for our sins once and for all and clears our consciousness too because Christ has truly obliterated our sins and they exist no more. And so that is what Jesus Christ has done. So let's go to the next slide and the verse continues on. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is today is not a part of this creation, talking about heaven. And he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the holy of holies, the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Hallelujah. Amen. So, and I'll finish with this one. And the last one is from Revelation. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. It's talking about the final end of the age, the new heavens, the final heaven, the current heaven and current earth are going to, they're going to pass away. The, the heaven that God is instituting, the new heaven, is the new Jerusalem that is going to come right and it says that it's adorned for her husband this beautiful bride and God will tabernacle with them forever they will be God will be he will be our God and we will be his people and we will be reigning with him forever and that is the symbolism of the feast of tabernacles now one final note about the feasts the first six of them, they are related to, in a sense, man's sin and struggle to exist. Whether it be the Feast of first fruits, whether it be Feast of um, Passover, all of these things. But the last feast, the Tabernacles, is related to rest. And so it's the most joyous feast of the year. And so again, it's providing us for a glimpse of the end of the age where we will enter the eternal rest and there will be an eternal joy and eternal pleasures in his right hand. And we'll close with this. We're going to look at Nehemiah 8. I know it's a lot of info, which I knew it was going to be, but uh, we... Um, Hopefully, it, it, it helps you understand, and hopefully, it will help us to look forward to his coming even more so. Now, Nehemiah, if you remember, this is one of the, there's, actually, you know, there's a number of stories of revival in, in the Old Testament, and this is one of them. It's one of the most moving scenes, I believe, in, in Israelite history. And basically, what had happened, of course, was the Israelites did not obey God. God kept on warning them, look, it's, you're going to be taken captive. They kept on not listening. They get you know, taken captive by Babylon. And then Nehemiah, right, and Ezra also, they lead people back to Jerusalem. And they rebuild the temple. So it's a second temple. The first temple was built by Solomon. And they said it was just so gorgeous, so fabulous. I mean, Solomon arguably was the richest man on earth during his lifetime. And I mean, he built this thing. They say when they built this second temple, that the young people rejoiced and wept because they were so awed by God's temple being restored again. But they say the oldest people wept and mourned because that second temple looked nothing like the first temple it was just that shabby 
But anyway, the younger people who didn't know better, I mean, it was a great day of rejoicing. But anyway, so they come back to restore the temple and the walls of Jerusalem, right? And these people had forgotten God's word so thoroughly, they didn't even know any of this stuff that we just talked about. So then it's, we're coming back to the word of God and seeing its power to revive God's people. As you know, this year, the theme for our church is back to the Bible. Uh, Pastor Han has been just continuing to instill upon his people and, and I'm personally very excited for that because God's word, it's not like we have to have like super new revelations and super anointed speaker or super anointed gifts. When we come back to the word of God and we live according to it, God's revival happens. And we will see a picture of this in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. So uh, picture this scene. Now they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and they're dedicating the temple and such. And so now this is what the people do. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So the people are eager to hear the word of God. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. What's the first day of the seventh month? It's the Feast of Trumpets. Okay. Now, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. So literally, Ezra, imagine this, he's reading God's word for about six hours and all the people are standing and hearing this spoken and they're, I mean, enamored. They're like captivated by these words because, again, they had lived in exile just forsaking the word of God. So, and the ears of all the people are attentive unto the book of the law. Next verse, please. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah. Okay, let's skip those names. All right, let's go to the next slide. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And he, when he opened it, all the people stood up. So every time he would open the book and rise, everyone would rise together for the hearing of the Lord. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Jeshua, Bani, and all these people, right, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So these Levites were explaining the law that was being read to the people, and these people are face down worshiping the Lord. And so they read in the book in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah uh, which is the Tershatha and Ezra the priest of scribe and the Levites that taught the people said unto all the people, This day the feast of trumpets is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, do not weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. So here it is. Ezra is reading the law. The people are standing for hours upon hours upon hours hearing the word of God for the first time in forever and they are face down on the ground weeping these people are worshiping crying amen amen and so here is a picture of a nation of israel that has returned back to their god and they had to actually tell them don't weep this is a day to celebrate because all the people it, it says for all the people wept when they he heard the words of the uh, words of the law so let's go to the next slide Verse 10, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord, neither be sorry for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's where the verse comes from. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, hold your peace for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat, to drink, to send the portions, and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. God's word brought them great joy. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests, the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. They come back to the word the next day. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in the booths in the feast of the seven months. So again, 
they have no idea that this is what they're supposed to do. You think Old Testament Jews, they should know this, but they didn't. When they read God's word, they realized, oh, we're supposed to celebrate for seven days this Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles. And so they, okay, reinstitute this practice during this time of Nehemiah. So let's go to the next slide. And that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, go forth unto the mount, fetch olive branches, pine branches, branches and myrtle branches remember palm branches from Feast of Tabernacles and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written go to the next and so the people went forth and they made all these booths so they went out telling all the other Israelites this is what we're supposed to do so you guys gather all these branches and so forth and we're going to make some temporary tents okay so these these uh, booths and made themselves booths everyone upon the roof of his house in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim and all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. Of course, Jeshua, it's, it's Joshua, okay, son of Nun, okay? So and this is a long time, okay? This is kind of like, this is almost like, 700, 800 years, more like 800 years. So they hadn't done this since the days of Joshua and there was very great gladness next slide please also day by day from the first day until the last day he read in the book of the law of God and they kept the feast seven days and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner is that it okay so again we see a picture of a revival happening in Israel as they heed the word of God and the, the, you see a picture of a day uh, of a week of great celebration as they celebrate this feast of tabernacles reminded of God's presence with them and these people so all of this I share with you I mean you know <laughs> believe it or not as I was preparing this I had to throw away like 90% of the stuff because to fit it into like one like 45 50 minute session uh, but all that to say, to recap in, Jesus, he was our Passover lamb who took away all of our sins, washed it once and for all, and he was raised from the dead to be the first fruit so that we will be glorified along with him because we are also spot free and that unleavened bread. And then now we are living in the time of Pentecost where God's spirit has been poured upon us. And that his spirit, of course, is a deposit of the greater things coming. And then now we await Jesus' second coming, where on the trumpet blast, Jesus shall come. And then the day of atonement will come, where we will no longer, we will not have to worry. The people who are against God, it will be the most fearsome day. It will be a day of great trembling. But for us, who have been considered to be free, no condemnation and set free by the blood of the lamb we have been made perfectly righteous in his courts and that we are awaiting for that festival of tabernacles where God will tabernacle among his people and he will be our God and we will be his people forevermore and so I pray that not only will we understand and I pray that the Old Testament will cease to be boring and that we will understand that Jesus' fulfillment and the richness of it when you talk to Messianic Jews, you know, Jewish people who are Christians, and they have a deep understanding of all of this, right? Because, you know, they know this stuff. Um, <coughs> there was this particular rabbi pastor, I remember, and he was sharing this, and there was just so much joy there was so much appreciation there were so much tears of joy in his eyes as he was explaining these things to gentile christians because i don't know about you but if you were that jew who was transitioning during jesus's time to a christian and you no longer had to do all of these things like every time they came before god they had to like kill these things and all of these little things and Jesus did it once and for all it would have just been mind-blowing and so to really understand all that Christ has done but not only that to understand these three fall feasts that represent Jesus's return that we would be people a bride that is awaiting 
his second coming and to live our lives accordingly because the eternal reality of Jesus' second coming should triumph over, should overshadow any temporary things that we're dealing with, with in this life and to be a people who are so grateful and so in love with Jesus that all we want is for him to come back soon as John the Apostle confesses in the last chapter, in the second to last verse in the whole Bible, come Lord Jesus, come. And it closes, and may the grace of God be with all of us. If I could ask the praise team to come.